All right, uh, the meeting is now being recorded. Uh, I want to welcome everyone to join our first weekly uh, development meeting since the start of 2021. Uh, very glad to have you guys here. So in this weekly meeting, we'll be wrapping up our discussion on CQL. Uh, just get this out of the way, um, you know, present any new findings, and then we'll start talking about uh, the plans for the next monthly development cycle. What are the things that we might want to do? Uh, so I'll be doing sort of a short update on my side. Um, well, which is, I don't really have any updates, unfortunately. I guess I was getting a little tired of running experiments on AWS and just have it terminated, uh, trying to make the uh, trade-offs between adding more code to make, uh, to sort of cope with this interruptible nature of using AWS spot instances, but decided not to. Anyway, not really much update from my side, um, uh, but Rosalind has some uh, really interesting updates from the CQL from the con with the continuous action domains. Uh, so if you like Rosalind, uh, feel free to take over and, uh, and uh, go at it. <laughs> Uh, Rosalind, I think you're still mute, muted. Uh, sorry. So uh, as I was saying, it's actually not that big of a progress. Uh, I will be sharing the screen real quick. Mm -hmm. uh, where is this again? Okay. So just, which just screen is sharing? Uh, yeah, I was able to see the screen on the offline continuous benchmark. When they be? Okay, nice. Yeah. Well, as a refresher, I mainly focused on the soft actor critic version of the conservative Q learning and did my best to, uh, to follow the original author's implementation with their various hyperparameter tunings and the uh, like. And as a benchmark, well, I mainly focused on a Hopper task from Mojoko and the Walker 2D. Mm -hmm. uh, so at first, uh, what I did here is to play with the, not really play, uh, set the alpha plan. Okay, let me bring this. Uh, it's equation three, right? Or equation four. The experiment mainly consisted in playing with this term right here, the alpha, which uh, multiplies the mean Q term. And in this case, the alpha is, uh, there is one version, uh, one titled without Lagrange optimization, which is uh, in green, like the same color from here on Mars. Mm -hmm. And uh, the one which actually uh, make this term dynamic. Right? So the alpha becomes uh, automatically tuned using the Lagrange optimization technique. Okay. And uh, for here, the, on the medium data set, demonstra de demonstration data set, mm -hmm. well, I think maybe if it's not exactly the offer's results, where is it? So yeah, there are around 2,000 uh, board points, mm -hmm. and it's not too far. And uh, you, we, you can also notice that uh, in a medium task here, as the agent trains, like the more time step we make, there's actually some uh, dip in performance. Right. So that's kind of weird, but yeah. it happens even in the original offers implementation over here. Mm -hmm. So I guess it's kind of... Uh, how it's supposed to go, in a sense. Yeah, I think in some of the Atari games, uh, I also see this performance degree over time, uh, which is, which is, I guess, kind of strange. Mm. Indeed. So I actually have an additional observation. 
Well, in this case, uh, let's see, it's the medium data set. And uh, notice how the automatically tuning alpha prime actually performs worse than the fixed one here. Mm -hmm. But then as the following experiments, I tried the different fixed value uh, for the mean Q weights. Mm -hmm. No Lagrange optimization. I tried the one mean Q weight with one, five and uh, 10. Mm -hmm. right? So small, average and very high. Mm -hmm. Here again, the, the intuition is that when the expert is not that good, right? This is media data mm -hmm. set. When it's not that good, we are actually better off using a small value for the mean, mean Q weight. Mm -hmm. And so being actually less conservative in our Q learning function, mm -hmm. the third part. And uh, well, correspondingly, the version that has the smaller version mean of mean q weight uh, performs mostly better well the 0.55 is actually not too bad that's performance wise mm -hmm. i think i have some additional note here yeah so alpha prime uh, determines how conservative the q function lower bound is mm -hmm. and uh, so having high value means that our q optimization is very conservative mm -hmm. and vice versa and when the expert is not that great, being less conservative is uh, actually better for the final performance. Okay. And uh, this, seems, this seems to match up, well, not really match up, but uh, makes sense as uh, we enter the hopper with the expert uh, demonstration data set. Mm -hmm. In that case, uh, my intuition is that uh, as the expert has a really good policy mm -hmm. he learned and thus generates better data, uh -huh. uh, using the high Q values actually result in having mm. the best performance. That's interesting. And, and, and that's the trend. Oh, yes, go ahead. Sorry, and, and yeah, so so I see that using uh, like a low mean Q weight actually performs really poorly. So exactly. You, using mean Q, uh, using a smaller number of mean Q weight actually means. Um, more optimistic right yes in a sense more optimistic mm -hmm. looking around a little bit more i see, I see. okay i see i see wow that's a really huge performance difference well the data set is expert also so mm -hmm. and i i think on this one it actually matches the original offer performance mm -hmm. more more than three thousand okay no around three thousand <laughs> and uh, in that case, with the automatically tuned alpha prime, well, I say alpha prime, but mean Q weight and alpha prime is actually almost the same thing. Mm -hmm. uh, basically, what I remarked is that the alpha prime here uh, always go to the maximum value. So no matter oh. what, I do, always <laughs> okay. go to the maximum value. So. Just earlier, I think I showed you the one with a mean Q weight set at 10, mm -hmm. but this one overrides the mean Q weight and makes it basically 100,000. Wow, okay. This is, this is actually the version that achieves the highest performance, and I will say pretty much the same as the author, right? Uh -huh. Just a little bit, 3,000, uh, just as uh, over here. Right and uh, around the same number of time step used also. While the version with the fixed uh, alpha prime or mean Q weight uh, does not perform that great, even on the expert data set. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, uh, okay, that's uh, with the hopper. On the Quick, Walker quick question. Medium... Oh, yes. Uh, so going back to what you had there, does the original author also post it, what their alpha prime becomes? Oh no, there is uh, absolutely no information on that. Okay, so so we don't know if their alpha prime also goes to ten thousand or not. Yes. Okay. Okay. That, I see. I see. Maybe I'll open an issue. <laughs> but I kind of want some closure. So I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they did do the experiments on the. I think it's uh, here, right? But they only say that okay, this one performed better. Mm -hmm. And that's pretty much it. There's no really 
uh, an analysis of the value that Alpha Prime itself takes. I right. think it's this one yes. with the Lagrange. Lagrange. Okay. Wait, so is over here 10 being the maximum? The, well, the 10 is a, and another hyperparameter that they use. Okay. To, so it's not the maximum, it's like more like a baseline. Okay, I see, I see. And uh, similarly to the Hopper, well, the same trend also shows up uh, in the Walker environments. Mm -hmm. uh, namely, well, when you have a really not that good expert, better use uh, low values. Mm -hmm. And when you have a very good expert, again, high value for the mm -hmm. mean Q weight. That's interesting. Probably this one. Uh -huh. Either high value or auto-tuned achieves uh, the best performance overall. Mm -hmm. It probably also depends on the task in general. Mm -hmm. I see, I see. And uh, let me check my note real quick. Okay, so last time I believe I also tried some experiment for a pipe bullet. Mm -hmm. yeah. I don't know if, if you... I had to make this uh, kind of a public uh, criticism, but uh, this was the... Pi bullet uh, T four RL Pi bullet collection mm -hmm. uh, of data set for the bullet environment tasks. Mm -hmm. And when I was using this one to train, there was absolutely no progress. Mm -hmm. So I uh, recorded my uh, own data set, custom data set. <laughs> okay. The agent. Uh -huh. And uh, training the SAC CQL on that data set I managed to well achieve a better performance anyway. So, uh, do you think maybe they screw up the, uh, somehow screw up the recording of the data set? Probably not screw up, but, uh, maybe version difference between the bullet and... Oh, uh, I see. Old, I think. Mm -hmm. I think that that's probably the main reason. Right, right. Or maybe there is some, there is a little difference in how they record the data too. But I thought it, it should be, uh, an important point to take into account. I see. Make sure that the the conditions, the same condition were used to generate the data set. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, I tried only on two environments, but uh, it also works on bullet and nevertheless. That's quite interesting. Yeah, I feel like bullet and although it's open source, it's usually a little less stable, um, I guess. By the way, yes. Uh, for for sorry for all of these experiments, uh, did you use a data loader? Um, did uh, by any chance? Oh yes, I have uh, cheated on your uh, implementation of experience <laughs> replay data set. Mm -hmm. Did it help? Oh yes, incredibly. Nice, nice. And uh, you you should probably recognize this from your yeah. <laughs> CQL, CQL. Nice, nice. Glad. I, I, I changed a little bit of, of some stuff, but here's the data loader, same num worker, and uh, it's quite fast. Maybe it trains fully uh, within 24 hours. I did not really. Also, I quite overloaded the server that was running the experiment. <laughs> it's quite hard to compare now. I see, I see. By the way, uh, what weight and biases version did you use? I think it's uh, set to the 0.9.2 because when I started using the, the other ones, uh, mm -hmm. kind of breaks everything. Yeah, so are you using? yeah, that's what I noticed with the newer version. Uh, it, anyway, I was just asking that question because I saw some videos were, were broken, the, the links. I, I didn't know whether you were using the newest version or um, just wondering the cause of it. It's, it might indeed have a, the cause might be the version. I am trying to check real quick. It's Pip Show, right? When ZB. It's using the 0.9.0, so quite old indeed. 0.9.0? I see, I see. Because when I try to upgrade, uh, whatever I logged, it would not show up on the 1ZB at that time. I just stayed with. Uh, yeah, so so a version that worked really well for me is zero point nine point five, I think. 
Yeah, I tried to upgrade it to a more recent version. It doesn't work very well. Um, actually, actually, I was mistaken. The one I was using is a 10.8. Yeah. 10.8. There you go. <laughs> yeah, it's it's that's only right. with the 10 point something that's, yeah, I don't know, a little problematic for some reason. Uh, uh, yeah. It was only me. I, I should try to post the issue really because this is it's getting ridiculous. This has gone on for quite a long time. It's kind of getting ridiculous. But anyway. <laughs> for me, it was around 0.9.2.3 that it started. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it makes sense. All right, sounds good. Um... And final closure. <laughs> <laughs> I also tried to implement the TD free version of the CQL. Oh, okay, and, nice. Uh, run a few experiments. Uh huh. Just to see how it holds up uh, on the. with uh, SAC. Well, the result is basically the same, so no surprise there, I think. And uh, TD3 and uh, SAC are, very, are rather different algorithms. So with TD3, um, do you have to do much modification like uh, SC, SAC or not really? Not really. I think they're actually not that different. The main difference is probably the structure of the policy. Mm -hmm. In TD3, it uses deterministic one plus, mm -hmm. plus a noises to do the exploration. But in SAC, we use like the sampling from the distribution, which mm -hmm. handles the exploration components. That's the main difference. Of course, I had to use a few tricks. Mm -hmm. For example, uh, when we sample at some point, we have to sample a lot of actions so that we can compute the mean q-turn components. So at that point, instead of using the, like we do in SAC, I use the noise. The noise function uh, is probably not as uh, good as what the original offer intended, mm -hmm. I think. Here's okay. where it happens. Once you get the actions from the TD free policy. Mm -hmm. I also added noise here, although it's the CQL term. And uh, another one which uh, re concerns the log probability version. <laughs> it's a, a bit a bad definition, I think. This year, where they compute, they add the log probability mm -hmm. of the policy mm -hmm. to the updates. I think this part here. I see. So I see. in the TD free, in TD3, the policy is deterministic, so we can't really have the log probability. Mm -hmm. So I use a form of cheating, uh, like a defining a distribution from the mean of the policy action, and then add the same noise that TD3 uses to simulate the stochastic policy, in a sense. I see, but I see. Still not too bad so far. Okay, okay. Say, but there is no like a uh, extreme gain in performance performs the same as uh, SAC. So. I see. I see. Okay. Uh, so I think I think that's uh, that's really cool that you <laughs> got it working. <laughs> yeah. Just 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 looking for closure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. For sure. And I think that's uh, pretty much about it for me. Yes. Nice. Nice. Sorry for taking too much time. <laughs> yeah, for the yeah for the CQL, uh, it's a it's a really uh, at least for the discrete uh, part, it seems quite easy. Um, uh, but it still takes some time to uh, I don't know do the experiments, wait for it. Um, I don't know. R recently, I've been just kind of focusing a, maybe a little too much on my car TS, try to speed it up and things. Well, especially on the discrete uh, tasks, since they are mostly Atari games and require some pixel-based, uh, well, pixel-related pre-processing, mm -hmm. uh, I think the training becomes quite, uh, takes way more time than in uh, Mujoko, for example. Oh, I see, That's I actually why I kind of shy away from those experiences. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I gotcha. Um... All right, that, that's that's very nice. That's very nice, Rosalind. Um, 
Alex, did you uh, have any updates on CQL by any chance? Or, or any um, thoughts? So, yeah, I'm, I'm willing to, uh, to let this one go. <clears throat> I, think, I think I've been spending a bit too much uh, time <laughs> on it. I, and, 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 you know, kind of not really making much more progress to when I tried a, a mm -hmm. few, I must be getting on three or four weeks ago. I tried adapting my code to um, incorporate the important sampling stuff to make it a bit more like their code mm -hmm. and it seemed to work all right on a few environments but um i think i must have messed up because on one of the random ones i think it's walker 2d random i actually get some like horrific scores of like uh, uh, sorry not walker half cheater mm -hmm. random i get like negative scores so i think i've messed up the code somewhere i see, I, see. I just had a quick look at the walker 2d medium and it's not as good as Roslyn, so I think I must have um, messed up my CQL code by trying to do the important sampling stuff. So basically, I've kind of gone a step back, a step backwards, <laughs> if anything. Um, I, I've, I've started to move on to other stuff now, um, mm -hmm. which is kind of timely, I guess, if we're, if we're all putting this one to bed shortly. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I feel like, yeah, this this will be the last week, I, I promise. <laughs> um, I feel your pain, Alex. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, 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 it's uh, like we've said, that their code is drawing from lots of different workbooks and different Python files, so it's quite difficult to, um, to follow. And I started doing an all right job, but then when I tried to make it better, I like, made it worse, so it de de demotivated me a bit. <laughs> I feel like, um, you know, this is just a new, uh, relatively new field and uh, it's sort of under study, under documented and a lot of aspect of the algorithms are not really well understood. That's probably why when we do either reproduction or try to do improvements, uh, we, we tend to run into various issues. Yeah, yeah. Um, um... I think I'll, I will end up coming back to it because I think it's CQL has... So I, I went to watch quite a few of the presentations from the NeuroX 2020, mm -hmm. and there are a few methods that incorporate some sort of conservative Q learning. So mm -hmm. I will go back to it, but, mm -hmm. um, because I was kind of working on it so much, I think it's kind of one of those, leave it alone for a few weeks, come back to it with a fresh perspective, maybe. Yeah, I think that, that sounds like a really good idea. Um... Yeah. And I, and I, I only tried it in the Majoco, um, continuous stuff with soft data critics, so... Mm -hmm. I, d I definitely need to look at the screen side of it at some point. Mm -hmm. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, all right. Uh, so I guess with that said, um, Rosalind, I'll review your PR. Um, I'll, I'll try to uh, give you some feedbacks and then uh, let's get the uh, PR merged. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll be yeah. only giving like small changes, not, not like big ones. <laughs> Um, yeah, so sorry, so sorry for the delay, I am, and uh, I am, yeah. I am sure you will, you will, uh, you will point out the test agent function. That one I already know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, sounds good. Um, all right, so with that said, I think uh, this might be a good point to start discussing uh, what are some topics that we want to look into for the next development cycle. So, um, I remember Rasa, you were mentioning about uh, Dreamer. Um, you know, if uh, if you like, uh, feel free to share a little more on that. Yes, Dreamer, 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 Dreamer. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry to put you on the spot. <laughs> uh, I, will, I will try to. I think it's learning latent behavior. So yes, uh, although the algorithm is uh, mainly presented as a reinforcement learning paper mm -hmm. uh, from the implementation side, as mm -hmm. I was saying at the early beginning of the meeting, mm -hmm. it uh, actually has more components from the deep unsupervised learning. Mm -hmm. uh, and why that? Because to learn this part of the 
the dynamics mm -hmm. of the mod here. Uh, we have to learn the latent state because we only have the observations. So we learn the latent state of the system and that's where we have to take the actions and take the reward, all that kind of stuff. So this is actually the, the most difficult part and it's only after doing this that uh, we actually get to implement whatever reinforcement learning agent itself mm -hmm. uh, in, that, in this case, SAC. And uh, so, so far I'm somewhere around here. Mm -hmm. and, uh, well, if you are really interested in model model-based reinforcement learning, mm -hmm. this should uh, bring you up to speed to even the most recent techniques, I think, because there is a lot of uh, techniques that they use mm -hmm. for the model implementation. And uh, even after that, basically this is well, dynamics learning, as I said before, mm -hmm. heavy variational infer inference. So, mm -hmm. Familiarity with uh, the VAE, Variational Autoencoder, is a really uh, suggested, recommended from mm -hmm. personal experience. Uh, so I don't know, since it's uh, originally like a reinforcement learning study group, I guess, maybe you, will, you guys will be reluctant to do this part because it's quite uh, shady. So I don't know. Um, I, I just uh, let it out so you can think about it. I have a quick question. Um, yes. How do you see um, Dreamer different from uh, Mu Zero? It seems that DeepMind is really pushing, uh, at least for the model-based reinforcement learning, on the Mu Zero side. Um, so, do you are, are you um, do you see any difference between them? Uh, what uh, what are your opinions on on them? As far as I remember from Mu Zero, I think they are more focused on discrete task, right? Mm -hmm. Or is it general? I, I don't know. But uh, the, they, they actually have this, the same component in the sense that the Mu Zero, what it does, you it builds the model and then it uh, uses a Monte Carlo tree search, right? Mm -hmm. To predict in the future, and predict everything, the reward, the action. So it's basically also dreaming in a sense. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, all the same thing as uh, this uh, little component here is doing so. Mm -hmm. They are, the concept is the same. The same concept is there. I see, so. Or is. I see, I see. May maybe with Mu Zero, it might be a little, in terms of, uh, for example, using Monte Carlo Tree Search to uh, search through the space, um, if it is uh, in continuous action domain, then it might not make much sense to do multicolor tree search because the action space is continuous, right? Yes, yes. So this is why in Dreamer they use a so SAC policy to do this, the job. I see. I see. Of the action searching. I see. I see. I'm not really familiar with Dreamer either. Just a fast pass. <laughs> I gotcha. Uh, back to Dreamer, once the dynamic dynamics learning is uh, done, mm -hmm. uh, the rest, well, there is a, again, a small, uh, okay, where is this? Okay, SAC here, mm -hmm. we treat the policy like a uh, SAC, so there should be no problem there. And uh, the last, uh, still a little bit blurry part for me is how they learn the value function, the critic that we use to update the SAC algorithm. So they have proposed uh, quite a few uh, like uh, formulation to compute that version. And uh, it's uh, a little bit like the GAE that is used in the PPO. Mm -hmm. I get the sense because they use the discount constant. I don't know if you remember that uh, function from SciPy, I think. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So uh, there, it has the same vibe but uh, it should not be that complicated, I think. Okay. And uh, I think that's the core components of, of this algorithm. So model learning and then critic estimation. And mm -hmm. then the easiest part would probably be the actor optimization. I so see, I see. Um... I just let, let it in there if you're still interested. 
Okay, yeah, yeah, absolutely. It, it looks it looks uh, very interesting. Um, also, probably so in a way, this might be like a mu zero on the continuous action side in in a sense. Mm. Might not be exactly like that, but <laughs> not exactly, but conceptually close, nevertheless. I see. I see. Um, okay. Uh, what about Alex, Lucas, or Niju? Do you guys have any um, papers that you guys have in mind that you want to take a look into? Sorry. Oh, sample factory? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, so, so, uh, so sample factory is, uh, is another fast algorithm that I, uh, that I was thinking about uh, reproducing uh, quite, a, quite some time ago. Um, but the main problem with sample factory, um, overall fast, on policy uh, gradient method has still has some particularities and um, from the implementation side it has a lot of uh, complexity as well um, so basically there's a new paper uh, that proposes algorithm called HTSRL let me share the link in the slack channel that in my opinion is basically doing a sample factory but except doing it maybe a little simpler uh which is to uh, let me may maybe share share the screen to uh, make this a little more concrete uh so are you guys able to see my screen uh yes Okay, great. Um, so uh, over here, uh, this paper HTSRL is basically comparing, uh, you know, what is sort of blo uh, blocking the unpolicy algorithm from going fast. So for example, over here, what you see is A2C. A2C is saying, you know, you have the environment steps, um, you have four environments and then they steps for a fixed amount of times for uh, their environment. And then um, they use an actor to forward uh, to get actions and then they step the environment again. But basically every time they have to wait all of the environment to finish stepping before generating actions for the new environment. So for A to C, that's what's sort of slowing things down. And then on the other hand, you have, uh, you have algorithms like, like Impala which basically have a learner that learns in parallel uh, as the actors are generating actions. So basically, as you see over here, there's not a lot of crevice because the actors is always generating actions uh, and so on. But this paper is basically saying that although Impala is utilizing the throughput very well, it's uh, you know doing a lot of updates and generating a lot of actions, a lot of the learning are actually not very helpful because the actors are sort of uh, stale because uh, say this learner um, is learning learning these data it's generating it's learning the data generated from an older policy so they're basically saying that this is bad and uh, you need some sort of synchronization you want to learn for a fixed number of time and then you stop learning and and uh, you don't generate new data anymore and then you learn this data and then uh, you update a policy and then you use the actor to generate new data. But uh, anyway, so sorry, that, that might be a little confusing, uh, but basically there's a lot of issues uh, with the distributed, um, with this sort of distributed online RL and uh, and also in terms of how you optimize the, the throughput, um, there's actually more tricky than I previously thought. Um, uh, in, in any case, I, I think um, both Impala and um, what's it called, HTSRL or um, Sample Factory are probably 
we, we probably would still want to see more papers before delving into it, I, I guess, in a sense. So if I understand correctly, the HTS uh, RL, mm -hmm. they uh, try to make use of uh, fresher data during the updates. Yes. Okay, I see. But o overall, I would say this paper and sample factory, especially from the implementation side, it feels like we will be more working on the like a multi the MPI libraries than anything else, or maybe that's just my impression. Not really the MPI library. That's another way to do uh, distributed RL. That's more of an open AI style kind of RL, where they use so MPI. Which one do they use? Huh? Uh, which one do they use? They use the MPI style. So for example, for project environment, if they try to speed things up, they use MPI. They're basically averaging the gradient of multiple workers which I, I don't think is a very elegant solution. Um, and uh, how about HTS RL? So uh, although they're using, you know, two different learners, they're probably averaging the gradient, but I think they, they really can just do it with one learner. You, I don't think you really need two learners. Uh, but the problem is they're basically saying we don't want to have the learners always learn and, and, um, and we have to wait for uh, this, we have to stop learning and then use the current policy to collect some data and before and then update to the new policy before actors collecting new data. Uh, so I was think I was basically reading their approach and what I end up doing is to make this executor uh, asynchronous um, and still using um, synchronous learner. And it would appear I get sort of similar throughput in a sense, maybe a little slower, but also get really good performance. Uh, uh, but that's where things get a little tricky. So are, are you still seeing my screen with the spider? Yes. Um, so I, I did try to code it, out, uh, code it up a little bit, uh, which I thought maybe it's it's a little technical, but uh, let me see if I can. So this is how you normally uh, do PPO, right? Uh, you construct the ends, and then every time, uh, let's say, uh, sorry, the ends is over here. You create sixteen environments, right? Let's say if you're uh, if you're using sixteen parallelized environment, and then it's basically saying for each step. Uh, get me the observation for the 16 environments, and then I use the agent dot get action from the 16 environments. So that falls into, excuse me, so that falls into this A to C kind of stuff. You're always waiting for the environment to synchronize before doing anything. So what I did uh, trying to implement this more uh, sort of a style like HTS PPL is basically using this sort of asynchronous environment where at least from the from the policy side from the synchronous part side you'll be getting like policy requests and then uh, you basically take these observations and you generate generate actions, and then um, and then uh, this asynchronous ints will take the actions, execute them, and store them properly. And then eventually you do the same thing as you would do in on policy PPO. So in a sense, it's a really good wrapper, um, but. But after I see how pro how Progen really makes it fast, it changes my idea about um, you know how we should do some of these things. Progen just says, uh, you know, don't do don't make the environment on the Python side. You do all of the synchronization. So in other words, um, so it's saying basically do all these parts. You see a lot of space over here. These crevices do all of these in another language like C++. Therefore, 
you would basically don't see the spaces at all, and it's much, much faster. So in a sense, it's even faster than this. Okay. It, it shouldn't be faster, but um, because the way you implement it, um, it ends up being faster. The, the problem the HTSRL tries to solve is actually not present or disappears mostly once you use a faster implementation on the C++ side, basically. Yeah, if you implement a lot of the synchronization on the C++ side, then yeah, it, it almost in a sense doesn't make... it Doing okay. this doesn't speed it up much further. Okay, but if we come back to the wrapper you have just shows, showed us before with the asynchronous request yeah. uh, of action to the policy, it will probably be ch quite challenging to put it into the C++ site. Yeah, exactly. Uh, that, that's where you, I think you can. If you do that, it'll be even faster than the project implementation in a sense. Um, but it's going to be a lot of uh, low-level details because in the asynchronous environments, uh, the, the object that I have also basically shares a memory uh, that stores the observation in proper places. And that kind of synergy between uh, C++ Multiprocessing, I don't know, it's just a mess. <laughs> uh, but also, if the sampling is also faster, I think the, the asynchronousity, the latency between two requests of action should become lower, and we should have a similar result to HTSR anyway. Uh, if you're because saying the, the, the latency is lower, it should be sort of similar, have, have sort, uh, similar performance? similar performance maybe not performance mm -hmm. as a result probably say performance but i think the, the problem the problem they're trying to uh, address will the, not be anymore since there was something about in impala it was something about the when the learner the, the learner does the update it uses uh, action well data sampled using old policy which in turn was due to the delay in the sampling and the updates, kind of. Right. Uh, okay, um, but sure. <laughs> ne never mind this rambling. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, and, and also in a sense, I feel like the modern, uh, the architecture that we have is actually not really suited for doing this sort of, um, in a sense, it's almost better to do this sort of asynchronous RL with uh, Apple Silicon. <laughs> uh, because when I profile the code, basically a lot of the costs happen at converting the observation into uh, copying into the GPU device and copying it back. Uh, Apple Silicon has a unified memory and that basically, you know, just avoids like 50% uh, or I, I don't know, a significant amount of the performance overhead. I see, I see. If that was, if, you know, PyTorch ever supports Apple Silicon, I guess, in a sense. When you say Apple Silicon, are you referring to the latest uh, CPU they have? Uh, yeah, so, proposed or? yeah, exactly. So their CPU and GPU share the same memory. And the GPU is still NVIDIA CUDA compatible? Uh, no, the they, they have their own proprietary GPU. Uh, however, you can do operations. So, yeah, so still uses PyTorch. It, theoretically, PyTorch could support <laughs> the Apple Neural Engine Accelerator, but anyway, that that's that's probably not going to happen anytime soon. <laughs> well, who knows? Yeah, but, but uh, we're probably getting a little over time here. Um, so, um. Does uh, anyone else have any ideas about, uh, you know, some of the papers that they want to, uh, they're thinking about? So if you're still interested in the offline reinforcement learning, there is um, some of the, what I would consider compared to CQU, slightly easier methods to code, such as batch constrained queue learning. Mm -hmm. That's quite a good one. Um, and then there's actually a slight variant of that that was presented at the NeurIPS con um, conference called 
latent action in the politics space, PLAS, P-L-A-S. That's very similar to BCQ. Um, okay. So there's kind of two that are related. So if you do batch constraint Q learning, then you can quickly modify it to this other slightly, um, this one where it's in the late, where basically the policies learned in, the, in like a latent action space from a, a variational autoencoder. So that's quite, those are two relatively straightforward ones if we want to do something in, in the offline setting. Mm -hmm. Do you have the link to the reference paper? Uh, yes, uh, hang on a second. So, uh, what's it called? It is called... So there's, there's patch constraint. Um, the, I, I was thinking about the nearest paper, the batch constraint. Uh, I, I, I think I, oh, I've know, seen that one before. Um, so, um, oh, wait a minute. Uh, Rosin just sent one. So uh, that's the latent action space for offline reinforcement learning? Yes, that's the one. Okay, okay. Nice, nice. So that's quite similar to BCQ. In fact, the code is based on BCQ, as far as I can tell, with some slight mod modifications. I see, I see. And, um, yeah, compared it's... to CQL, it's much easier to, to code up, per personally. <laughs> that, that'd that be really nice. And it looks like they've got pretty good performance. Yeah, they've got comparable. Um, they, they report some raw scores in the appendix compared to some of the other methods. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, yeah, it's, it's not bad. I see, I see. That's, that's really cool. Uh, okay, uh, any other thoughts? That, that's a really good suggestion, by the way, Alex. <laughs> that's all right. I see they're also making use of a VAE, it seems. Yes, so they use um, a variational autoencoder to learn the behavior policy, which is basically the, the policy data set policy if you like uh, I see. oh yeah i see i see well as soon as you have a latent in the title i guess you can expect variational inference according yeah. to yeah yeah exactly <laughs> nice nice um okay um... it actually might be a good warm-up for uh, dreamer too since they use a VAE anyway yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the, the code for but BCQ and PLAS are uh, just really nice, really nicely laid out. And there's only a couple of um, couple of files, and you, you just it's all laid out quite clearly. I feel. I mean, I I, I don't I still don't have much experience with Python, and I was able to do it and replicate the results pretty easily. Mm -hmm. So anyone with more experience should be a a doddle. <laughs> okay. compared to compared to CQL anyway. Uh, are you are you saying the uh, are you saying BCQ? Uh, yeah, so BCQ, um, I'll, I'll put all some links all in the, in the Slack afterwards, but BCQ, there's some nice code for that. Mm -hmm. And then if you know BCQ, then it's quite easy to adapt to uh, this this new PLAS one. I see, I see. Um, yeah, yeah, the, um, <laughs> these two suggestions uh, all sound very good to me. Um, uh, B. Rosson says, B A F K for four minutes. Um, well, we're already sort of extending our time uh, here. So uh, what I'll do is I'll put these two uh, paper, uh, BCQ and um, Dreamer, these two papers in a Slack and put up a vote. And then uh, we'll, we'll just do it. And then when Rosslyn voted, we'll make a decision and uh, I'll just let you guys know in Slack. Uh, how does that sound? Yeah. Yeah, yeah sounds good. Um, okay, okay, uh, that sounds good. Um, yes. So let's probably try to wrap up here. Uh, thanks everyone for coming. Um, hope you have a good weekend and uh, I'll see you guys next time. Cool. Thanks. Good. Thank you. Thanks for, for the, yeah, thanks for the presentation, guys. Thank you. Have a good weekend. <laughs> Thanks. You too. Thanks. I'll see you. Bye. Bye.